All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Erin Maney. I serve as our Manager of Community Engagement and Communications for SUNY. In partnership with SUNY's FACT 2 Task Group on Open Pedagogy and our Conference on Instructional Technology, I'd like to welcome you to this Open Education Week webinar this afternoon. Um, I know some of you have joined us before, but if you could type your name in the chat just to let us know where you're tuning in from, that helps us understand our audience. Thank you. So today we are pleased to host uh, Jay Jang, Professor of Special Education in the Department of Education and Human Development, joined by colleagues Mary Jo Orzek, Associate Librarian, and Ann Perlman, Coordinator of International Curriculum and Senior Instructional Designer. On behalf of the SUNY Community of Practice, I want to thank you all for joining us today and sharing what you know about open education resources. So I will turn this over to you. Thank you, Erin. Sure. So, hello, everyone. My name is Jay Zhang from Education Department uh, at SUNY Broadport, and uh, together joining me, I have Dr. Mary Jo Ozad and uh, Anne Perlman. So let them introduce themselves. Hi, all. Mary Jo Orzik from SUNY Broadport. Um, I'm in the um, in the uh, Scholarly Communications Librarian here in Drake Library, and I'm on the our Brockport um, OER Advisory Committee as well. So I'm Andrew Alico Perlman, and I'm a Senior Instructional Designer, and I've been uh, the COIL Coordinator. So I'm here to talk about some of the things we did with uh, OERs and COIL, and tell you how we led into that. Okay. So together, we're going to share our journey of implementing OER for meaningful student learning outcomes in our COIL courses. And also, we're going to provide you some examples of how we did in our COIL with the OER. And our ultimate goal is to um, discuss about how we support students to increase their intercultural competence. So here we are. So I wanted to just review and remind folks what, what our OER, in this context, we're really talking about our teaching, learning, or resource, research resources. They're in the public domain or they're openly licensed. They're have, they ha allow you to be to retain, reuse, re revise, remix, and redistribute. And they include a variety of kinds of materials, such as textbooks, videos, readings, images, and more. More importantly, the question is why use OER for COIL courses? And of course, this applies to all kinds of courses, but in particular, it it's relevant and I think it, it's very compelling for COIL courses for the following kinds of reasons. Of course, it saves students money. That's number one in their minds. But it also enables the first day of class access. As you know, mounting international classes and um, courses with students from multiple countries requires a lot of logistics and planning. And so if the students can all have access from the first day, that makes a huge difference in terms of their um, uh, access to um, being able to, to get to the materials on time. It also provides round the world availability. No matter where you happen to be these days in a very mobile uh, kind of world, it allows it, um, folks to access the materials and, and um, uh, be part of the class wherever they happen to be located. One of the most important ones, I believe, is that it allows flexibility to adapt the courses and classes as needed. And this means that students can be part of the learning journey as well in terms of being able to contribute, not just um, consume the information, but being able to um, create um, um, some of the things with non-disposable assignments, but also contributing to things like OER textbooks themselves or being giving um, uh, meaningful feedback so that they are, are really part of this uh, um, activity as well. Um, and they have ownership and can be um, uh, um, important, they are important as stakeholders. It also can really impact our learning outcomes and the research is still coming to bear on this, but we know that it is making a difference in a fair number of, of cases, 
that um, it can impact the um, uh, outcomes overall. Finally, um, when you speak, when we're talking about social justice and equity, equity, we know that it really is the right thing to do. It really allows both haves and have nots from a whole host and range of, of students from all kinds of backgrounds to have access and to be able to partake in uh, as fully as possible in, in classes. I'm now going to um, transfer to um, Jay to talk a little bit about some of the examples of how she's using this in her classes. So Jay, take it away. Okay, sure. Thank you, Mary Jo. So um, I would like to confirm uh, what Mary Jo was talking about. First of all, it uh, saved my students a lot of money. Since 2016, from my first semester to offer OER, I kind of did a calculation and it is estimated that it has uh, saved my students about $40,000, um, basically about $100 per student. And uh, also it makes my course more flexible and I can adapt my OER to my courses so that it's uh, flexible and it's tailored to my students needs. So for example, uh, what you have been seeing from the slide is about a gap of diversity in American schools, especially K-12 school settings. We see there's a, a gap of increasing number of students from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. However, the teacher remains the similar population which uh, are white and uh, female and uh, most likely mid-class um, teachers. So there's a gap between the diversity from the student's population and the teacher's population. And uh, Howard mentioned about we cannot teach what we don't know. So that comes to be my essential question about how can I do, what can I do to prepare my teacher candidates uh, which mainly white female teacher candidates is uh, usually coming from middle class backgrounds um, to be able to work with all students um, from different uh, culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds. So that's how I started to collaborate with my colleagues and Mary Jo and other colleagues um, to figure out how to embed the OERs into my choreo courses. These are some examples I worked with other uh, universities internationally. So uh, spring 2018, that was my first COIL course with Malmo University, Sweden. And uh, my international partner uh, teaches culture and media course and uh, my course is introduction to special education. And uh, we uh, come up with a joint project about people with disabilities in media. So that's our common project for both students. And then the next semester uh, for 2018 to spring 2019, I worked with a partner from Brazil and uh, her course is um, inclusion education in Brazil. And I, my, uh, mine is introduction to special ed. So our common project for our students uh, uh, is the comparison of special education and inclusive education between US and Brazil. And the third course was a collaboration with international, with a Chinese university, Changzhou University. And um, my partner teaches safety engineering and mine is assessments for special education. And our common project is on uh, safety prevention and the intervention between US and China with my students uh, interview teachers and the school personnel, how uh, the protocols here in US. And the fourth and the last um, collaboration was with a Mexico University. And this was a three-way collaboration. Uh, my assessments for special education with my colleague here at Brockport on oral history and the Mexican partner uh, uh, with uh, education and technology as her topic. So the three of us collaborated and we found the common project of the interview and comparison of education system between US and Mexico. 
as you uh, may find out so far, uh, without OER, without the flexibility of the resources, I won't be able to do so many different COIL projects with so many different international partners. So I'm going to just give you one example of how we change to do our icebreaker. So for each of the COIL course, so we want to have an icebreaker, which is fun and interactive to bring all students at the same page. And uh, th this is the first activity I did, which I adopted from my colleague. And, and um, so we asked them to think about a picture of the partner university, think about their favorite food, think about the language their partner university or partner peers were talking about. And then they share. So they do Zoom meetings, they do Skype, or they use WeChat when we come to the Chinese partners. And students had a lot of fun. However, as a professor's perspective, I felt we need to put it into um, um, an, another level of critical thinking with the research base, with some uh, more discussion. So the current version, which I collaborated closely with Anne and our librarian, Jennifer Kegler, is that we brought, we continued our iceberg, iceberg concept of culture uh, with different levels of cultures, like shallow surface, shallow and deep cultures, and with the YouTube. And then uh, Jennifer was great. Uh, under the leadership of Mary Jo with the OER, and she created a library database for my student, for our students, and Anne's class is also was also piloting it and uh, uh, making some changes also. And our students, before they met with in their international partners, we asked them to prepare uh, to go to the library resource and then uh, to understand more about their cultures from their partner peers. And in my class this semester, I particularly used this Venn diagram. I asked my students to compare and contrast um, between Chinese and the US cultures, both from surface culture and deep culture. And also I used this KWL chart, like what did, what did you know? What would you like to know? Uh, what have you learned? What else do you want to learn? So this KWL chart, uh, it's still in process, but it gave my students a deeper and a higher level of thinking about their own culture as well as, as their partner's cultures. And also um, to me as a professor, I can evaluate or assess my students from both pre-assessments and uh, post-assessments to see their growth from this COIL project. So I'm going to uh, leave the room for my colleague Anne to introduce her courses. So um, what I think what you're going to hear a little bit about is um, Jay and her class and many of our COIL classes and others, you have to really make a lot of the materials in order to, for the flexibility, but also to meet the, the student learning outcomes that you're really looking at. And this whole idea of introducing a, a global piece into there, you're, um, you know, you're bringing in a, a cultural competency and things that's a little outside of one textbook. So I think that that's part of the things that we were looking at is it's very different. So all the effort that, like in, in sorry, Jay's class, for example, there's a lot of um, uh, links to things, a lot of her lectures and everything is in there beyond um, following one textbook. So I want to talk a little bit about my path in, uh, to OER. So I have my own as a teach, as a adjunct or faculty member, and then also in support of all the COIL courses. So originally, I, um, I, I taught uh, introdu introduction to video and audio production at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and then here at Brockport. And I started seeing very early on, this was before we had Mary Jo Wonderful here to talk to us about OERs. So this was before we had, we knew about that. So when I started to see, I'm not sure if you can see me here, the books that I had in class, the video production books and the uh, uh, editing books, what was happening was um, the, the technology is changing so quickly that the wonderful part of concept, the concept stayed the same. You can t teach a student how to tell a wonderful story with lighting and sound and everything, but the technology itself was changing yearly. So every time we have students buy a book, by the next year, there was no way to have a, uh, 
to buy a used book or anything like that because the tools had changed already. So that was part of it. I also never really taught to the textbook. I never went chapter by chapter. So my thoughts were, I'm having students buy books. They're going to use just a piece of it, a chapter here and there. So is it really, uh, does it equate to the cost in that way? Part of, like the, I mentioned, the video production book, the front of the book has all these chapters that remain, remain the same. So you, you know, it's, it's lighting, it's framing, everything like that. So what I did was I found out that the video production book that I had, like I said, prior to knowing there was OERs, I went to the library and I found that there was a version that was three years older that the students were able to access online for free. So, I did, so knowing that the concept hadn't changed, I could use that textbook. The issue we had at the time though, was um, because the way our system was set up, if a student wanted to read the book, they could, and but it, it, they had to check it back in electronically for the next person to read it. So that was quite the training for them. I had the librarian come and do that. So that was my beginning into uh, ways for students to be able to have textbooks that were not gonna, that I could use just a chapter or so and um, wouldn't be the, the burden of the cost and pieces like that. The editing books alone, this premier book here, I just saw one today, in fact, it was $70, $65. The problem with the tool, these books such as Premier or any type of editing, um, the, the first chapter says, what's different with the technology? What's new in Premier? Well, they had no prior knowledge to know what was new at all. So these books for them, I noticed that following the textbook, step-by-step, step, I started to notice less and less the students, that was the, the way they were learning. So we were getting away from the idea of just-in-time teaching there. So what I did was um, to, to augment these and to make things different, um, I did find on Merlot, which many of you probably know about Merlot, that, uh, that was one of the early OER um, uh, sites. I did find a, a really good video production, lighting and everything on Merlot that I was able to have them tap into. Yeah. And this, like I said, this is, I can't tell the year now. And what else I, uh, for the editing, uh, I, we were able to look at lynda.com. Now lynda.com was a cost at the time. Um, they went from a large cost down to $10 a month. Students could you know, you know, use lynda.com to, they were trying to get campuses to, to purchase Lynda and, and many campuses did, ours did not. So what I did was for them to be able to use for the editing, what I did for them was they could get a New York, New York Public Library card early in the semester and they were able to access that to teach them the editing. Now, everybody here probably knows you can make all these yourself. You can make all the videos and everything yourself. But since the technology changes so frequently, it was, it was um, easier for me to, in a sense, not to have to remake all the videos all the time to use a tool such as this. So that's what started it. And then we came into the pathway to OER for COIL. Our first COIL class began with a course with Russia, and many of you probably heard me say this before. And um, Dr. Lisevoy, Dr. Barbara Lisevoy, she has three required textbooks that she wanted students to be able to read. And we found out, we had, a, we had a, one of our librarians here, Pat Maxwell, we had to try to get the students from Russia into our library in order to get access to the books. Because they are, they are um, bi they're bilingual in the sense are probably multilingual. So they are able to access that, but it became really cumbersome. So we had to find other ways and not using the textbook. So we've used, there's an example. This was the textbook, Half the Sky. And what Barb did was we started looking at uh, articles that were out there and then we did find the film. And the film was, uh, for what their purpose was, equivalent wise, to have a deep conversation about women and gender studies, the film really worked. So we started stepping away into what can we do and, and take away the technicalities behind it all. And what happens here is the students read this literature and then they're able to have these deep discussions. So they're, before they get together, they're reading, like, like Jay said, they're reading case studies or they're reading literature, and then they come together in this, uh, uh, so this global thing happens because they're bringing in their own perspective. So we were able to start stepping away from it by doing things like this. So now I teach a, a course called um, Advertising and Consumer Culture. And so far I've had a partner in Amsterdam and a partner in Brazil. Uh, again, both stu all students can read and, and, they're, uh, and, and read and speak English, I should say. So I went online and, and with the help of Mary Jo, I was trying to find some books that would talk about marketing. In the class, I'm trying to teach the students about what is the concepts of marketing, that's the basic. Then we're looking at cu culture. What is the, how, how does the culture, what does it the play into with the culture? And we're looking at the culture that we're working with. So again, there was no book. That, there is a book that uh, the other faculty are using. There, there, are, there are six sections of this course when it's fully running. It's a, it's a gen ed. 
and the others are using the book fully, so chapter by chapter. And for what I wanted to do with Coyle, it, that was not going to fit. It was really more about America. It was all about America in a sense. You know, all the cultural concepts were about feminism and things that were cult to our culture, not another culture as much. So I wanted to find pieces. So this is one of the books that I found. And um, in there, it, there are um, some chapters that, like I said, they can turn to. I can, I can assign certain chapters. The pro I will say a couple problems with the, not to deter anybody from using them, but this one was a little more difficult to read. I was able to download a PDF and students were able to read it, but it is not accessible, I will say that. But they could get the material they need and we keep looking forward. And then um, my partner in uh, Amsterdam, she brought in, so my class I was talking about uh, consumer advertising. She's a business teacher, but her special, her area of focus was on um, presentation skills. And actually my class had that code, you know, code in there where students need to do an oral presentation. So we found on Lumen Learning in the same class, but this is the third, this is the second of text things that we used. We found Lumen Learning had things on how to do um, uh, different types of presentations. I wouldn't say it's the strongest right now. This one is probably hopefully going to get better, but I was able to, again, pick out certain chapters in here and share with the students. And I did see from the other book we just talked about and this one, I was seeing the reference. I was asking that these are being referred to when they're giving their, their um, doing their citations for their presentations. I was seeing that the, that was in there. They did use the material. We also, um, this is, I'm only talking about the text things here, but there was a lot of video, a lot of lectures, a lot of other things that we create ourselves for the course. This is my partner from Amsterdam giving a lecture on a certain style of um, presentation. I'm saying it wrong, but it's Petra Kucha, but I'm saying it wrong because it is totally something else. But she gave that style. So they were able to hear now use Lumen, again, just some chapters. And then more recently, I found this book. And it actually reads better for students. It's more like a book. And I would say, uh, and in the end, it talks about how they're trying to make all of it accessible, which I think is very key to us. But I, in here, I was able to find some really good chapters on culture and um, digital culture and social media. So I'm able, again, to pick out some. I think this one I like better just for uh, readability for students. So I keep looking and changing. And it's, I think that's the, the reality of this is uh, it takes much more work for a lot of this, like with anything, all my faculty involved in online or COIL, they do more just in general. So this is something, but it is adding a benefit to the, for the students. Unless you're teaching to a text, as we all know, there's 15 chapters in a text for a reason, because there's 15, 16 weeks, we know how that works. But unless you're using that and they're gonna buy a textbook and use the whole thing, I think we're, uh, this is a better way. So I do want to talk about how what happened for me that made this work. And Erin's going to get a good plug right here because she was involved in this. I was lucky enough to be to um, be selected to be one of the people that went for the training with Center for CPD, Center for Professional Development and OER. Eric was there, Chris Price, and Alexis. Uh, and I can't. I have to say this, and I'm saying this very honestly. That was the best training I have ever been to. So what we did in the course was, in order to prepare to look for the best OERs for ourselves, uh, we, we did the backwards design of, uh, on our course, we looked at the backwards design of teaching. So we focused on what our student learning outcomes are supposed to be. We spent, we spent it was a day and a half, the full day was on our student learning outcomes. And then we were, uh, they put together this, this um, uh, spreadsheet for us to look at our goal and then what, what were you gonna do to assess and then our assignments, and then the really looked at the reading. So one of my goals, which I have yet to get to, which I'll show you, and Jay, Jay kind of shared that one slide with you. I'm looking at how am I gonna get a cultural competency in there. And um, I'm turning to Mary Jo too, to help me now look for some things that can talk a little bit about competency. So I think what happens with our students, they get these experiences with these other students, but I don't really know if they know how to articulate it without having something to get, tell them give them an idea what this means to have, have this competency. So I'm presently looking for those things. But this training was the best thing. I think going through that and, and really looking for things, then turning to our own librarians was the best way to find stuff. And what was nice about it is you got to look at what you didn't like, what you did like after you got to your, your outcomes. So from that, this is what Jay was talking about uh, from that. I did work with the librarian this summer to uh, work on this data, this uh, um, I'm trying to look at the competencies now and there was we're telling our students we want you to understand others but there was no um, in our library it was all based on discipline all of the databases were based on discipline 
So um, one of li librarians, Jennifer, put together this country and culture database in there. So now when they, we have a place for them to go and start to do the research. We don't know yet if it's going to work with the, because it is our library, if it's going to work with others. And we have, we just started this. So it's something we're going to roll out, but it is, uh, maybe there's a way for us to put together one that um, other ca campuses could use in, in, in internationally and get to some of this same data, same material. And we're working with, when you see this iceberg model here, this is, um, that's the model Jay was talking about. When you look at a culture, you know a third about them. It's like an iceberg, you know, most of what you don't know is below the surface. So there's an example of how we're using a lot of things on YouTube and everything. My only concern is if we're using that, if it's gonna go away. So we may have to um, find our own, it, you know, and we, we're always looking to see if it is open completely, if, if it has uh, the right copyright on it and things like that. But that's where we're heading with um, looking at it now. So we're constantly looking forward, constantly looking how we can do this. And like I said, I, I watch how hard Jay works on her class to make it fully o OER. So, um, and all my, all, I still have the other faculty too, but this is the way we've progressed here in looking at how to make things for our students and, uh, and our, our partner students in internationally. So, Aaron, I guess those are our slides. Uh, I, I think we're ready for Q and A's, if people are ready. Sure, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the information, too. And I appreciate the, the three different perspectives that you all bring to this as well. Um, I, we've had a couple comments and some conversation happening in the chat. But um, one of the things that came up is I wonder if you could give an overview of COIL, maybe for some who aren't as familiar with it. If you oh, could sorry, talk about you that. Sorry, we did first. So um, COIL, SUNY COIL, SUNY Collaborative Online International Learning. What, what COIL is, is um, it is a, it's a SUNY initiative, and it's actually called Virtual Exchange. It's known worldwide wild as virtual, International Virtual Exchange. And what we're doing is we're having faculty from um, our campuses, SUNY and others across, across, the, uh, across the United States, partner with an international college, and you, uh, partner with the faculty from another college internationally, and they're developing a, a lesson together or a, a course together. And it's being taught through Virtual Exchange. So that's really, that's the, that's the bottom line of pretty much what it is. And um, Mary Lou Ford is the executive director of it. And um, we've been doing this, like I said, for quite some time. It's grown very large. We have many, many people looking for international partners at this point. So on our campus alone, since we've started, we just realized that we've gotten more the last few years. We've gotten over 900 students through um, this type of experience without leaving campus. So. We have the technology, we have the um, ability to teach together, so this is what we're doing. And that's a, so sorry I didn't explain that earlier. Okay. And so these I, can be full courses or just projects even, right? And they don't yeah. have to be, okay. Yeah. Right, so for my courses, they're all projects embedded in my courses, which usually will last four to six weeks. And how about yours, Anne? It's, um, mine is about the same depending on, well, sometimes they're, uh, eight weeks, depending on length of time per, per assignment, depending on and my partner. Yep. And the one I mentioned first with Dr. Lisa Boy, that is a full semester. Do you work jointly with another faculty during that whole period of time? Do you have to be teaching the course? Like, say I'm not teaching a certain, that course at that time, because it might change for me. Well, yes. Well, it happens quite a bit that, um, like, um, my one faculty member does it every other every other fall. You know, so it's when they she knows she's going to have the class, and then they talk together. Yes, it it varies, and sometimes partners. It's nice when you can have them continually, but sometimes you know life changes, and sometimes they move on to other things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, every semester. No, and it's it should be. Um, planned well and planned ahead and mm -hmm. our international partners like to start a little quicker but we kind of need some we need planning time right because I, I created an OER for my course and I don't teach that course anymore and yeah. I was just wondering how that would work you know Go ahead, take yeah. it. so yeah. that's a great question Jamie uh, I, I believe I agree with and uh, coil needs a lot of flexibility from our faculty perspective like I my first coil courses with uh, Mammo University 
a university Sweden, and uh, we spent uh, a whole semester planning for it, and then we conducted uh, uh, that uh, COIL course for one semester, and then my partner got promoted, and she was just uh, too busy with other things, so we never go back to it. And for my second uh, COIL course with my Brazil partner, similar things, we planned for one semester and we conducted it for two semesters. And then she was promoted to be um, their, their colleges or their universities um, provost. So she got so busy <laughs> with other things. So I said, well, if you want to be promoted, maybe become my COIL partner first. That's <laughs> how uh, my three the three COIL partners uh, have been, uh, including the last one, the Mexico pa Mexican partner, she got promoted to be the chair of the department and uh, was too busy this semester. So, so right now my only COIL course is with the Chinese um, professor and the next semester she's going to be on her sabbatical. So we have already been planning, like she's uh, delivering her materials and everything to another colleague. So hopefully we will be able to continue this COIL project. So that's a part of COIL to be flexible. Yeah, I think the other thing is too, is I did it, I had a class and one semester I, I worked with my partner and then I thought I really, since I was the first time teaching a class, I needed to get a grip on it myself. So I did it without her having the, having the culture component in there. I had them look and not necessarily connect with another, but so I was able to change without worrying about, oh my goodness, I had this whole class plan, now what? So I was able to continue it on by keeping in the open educational resources and things about um, the cultural in there. So I was able to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thought too, like, so both classes are running side by side using the same resources because they both have to speak like English and right? And all that. So you're every both classes are going simultaneously from their own. We might be using Moodle, and they might be using their own mm -hmm. learning system. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You're not, and, and always you're not necessarily. See, with our readings, um, like with Dr. Lisa Boys, with half the sky, she had her class do the reading because they had a paper due, and the other class did not. So being able to have the film was was enough for both to have the conversation and to do what they needed to do. Their, their final assignment was to make a uh, public service announcement on uh, issues of women and gender study. So the depth of what was needed there, her students had, had to come up with scholarly paper too. So not always are the, um, the readings as in, as in depth on either end. So, but um, you come to the same project or something, some outcome. Uh, last semester, my, my students, they, they mentioned in Brazil, they didn't have the tools to make anything. We were doing advertising. And I think her students were disappointed because they didn't ask them to make it a, a, a commercial like mine did, because um, I think they would have, but ours actually made it and theirs reviewed it. So okay. it depends on what the partnership comes out to be and what you're really, what your learning outcomes are. Right. Yeah. So Please. for my courses, uh, in addition to the COIL projects, which are focusing on intercultural competency and uh, uh, working with the, um, people from diverse backgrounds as well as collaboration, uh, competency. I also have other materials and the learning object, uh, learning, uh, learning outcomes that I need to cover for my certain courses. So, like each time, uh, there are several things going on simultaneously for my students as well as for my partner student, partner university students as well. Are you at what campus are you with Moodle Empire State or? Um, no, Delhi. Delhi, okay, because I know a few, and, and I know Fredonia had, had one of the other ones. Yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. You have a really good person there at Delhi to help you. Yes, Eileen. Yes. I'm on a lot of committees with Eileen, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yep. Yeah. I'll get in touch with her and see oh, yeah. what the options are. I'm just curious, yeah. yeah. Great, any other questions or comments? You can also feel free to unmute yourselves. I know there's such value even in just having the students discuss with each other, you know, and just connect around a topic, even if they're not doing the same project or um, learning in the same way. It's just great to have them do that sort of global collaboration. So do they talk to each other from the two classes? Some classes, some class, classes can, be as, can be synchronous and others are asynchronous, depending, depending on time. There's a lot of variability in there, but um, they can, Jay's class, 
actually we're going to talk but now because of um what's going on in china right now they're working from home so they made recordings at this time instead i think it might be nice to have jay tell you a little bit about how much her whole class is oer though do you have, we have a few minutes and maybe yeah that'd be interesting. no question there's no other question sure thanks and yeah. um so uh 2000, back to four 2015, I have to give credits to Mary Jo here. She was the one who uh, sent us an email saying, would you like to think about OER? I was like, oh my God, <laughs> do I really want to think about OER at that time, like uh, to transfer all the whole class into an 100% OER. And then Mary Jo was so supportive and encouraging. So I said, oh, I, I, I would like to give it a try. And then after that, I never came back to other like a textbook or something, um, just because of the benefits of OER, uh, especially the OER's uh, benefits to the coil, uh, which is so flexible for me to, and my partner university's professor to select the materials and select the uh, common projects for our students, to tailor to our students' needs and courses, et cetera. So uh, in four 2015, just because Mary, because of Mary Jo's email, um, we get into a group to a, a pilot group. I think six people. Mary Jo can talk more about that. Uh, about four to six faculty members under the leadership of Mary Jo uh, to transfer our course one course uh, into OER and then uh, we start from there and then spring 2018 I was brought to the coil by Anne so yeah I would like to invite Mary Jo to talk more about uh, the OER and how it goes on campus. Well of course this is part of the big SUNY initiative to um, help bring um, make materials available and keep textbook costs affordable for um, for students. And it's not just about OER anymore. It really it has branched out to open educational practices and open educational um, uh, um, in general, uh, pedagogy and so on. And so it's not just the materials. It's really about teaching and learning. It always has been. I think that needs to be underscored. And so we're finding people are taking lots of different avenues and lots of different routes. But the idea of keeping these materials um, uh, making them available for our students and really thinking through some of the equity issues that, that this um, uh, allows and enables. Um, it really affords some tremendous advantages that um, we would not have really necessarily have thought through or considered in the, in the past in quite the same way and certainly not systematically at, at a statewide level. Um, it's really just um, happened at the right place. We were at the right place at the right time. It's been a huge um, uh, um, undertaking in terms of um, the, the benefits and advantages that we're seeing throughout. If you haven't tried it, we certainly are welcome to, to um, certainly reach out to whoever is the OER representative on your campus um, um, and, and get involved for the upcoming years. We're very fortunate that the funding is continuing and we hope to see you all uh, 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 going forward. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I'm going to uh, just switch over to wrap up so folks can see the slides here uh, with the URLs. But um, we just want to make everyone aware, I did post it in the chat as well, that um, Open Education Week webinars are being recorded. And we will post the recording and the slides in uh, on our website there, that bit.ly SUNY OEW. 2020. There are also other events happening around the globe for Open Education Week. We would invite you to take a look at the Open Education website for some other things. Uh, we, SUNY, is hosting uh, another webinar today at 3.30 and then one each day for the rest of the week um, at noontime. So you can see that schedule there as well. And uh, we thank you so much for your attendance and your participation. And we hope to see you at another event soon. Thank you thank so you. much, Erin. Bye. Bye. Thank you Bye. to my speakers. Bye, thank you. Bye.